This week's episode of the School of Last podcast is brought to you by Patreon supporter Ron Havens. If you'd like to learn how you can support the podcast through a small recurring monthly donation, check out schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And we also have a special guest sponsor this week. Hi, this is Leslie Norris Townsend, and I'm here to invite you to be a part of the Clean Comedy Challenge 2017 in Pasadena, California, and in Chicago, Illinois. This is our seventh year for this one-of-a-kind conference that includes three days of learning, writing, performing, and hanging with the pros in the comedy business. The Clean Comedy Challenge invites comedians of all levels for a chance to work on a real comedy stage with an added church venue at each level location. Past attendees include Johnny W., Claiborne Cox, Marty Simpson, Andy Benango, Mike Paramore, Charlene May, and Todd Justice. So if you work clean or just want to work clean, go to www.cleancomedychallenge.com. When you register, make sure you mention the School of Laughs podcast so I know where you came from. Remember, there's no auditioning, limited space, early fee before May 1st. Come on, get on board the Clean Comedy ComedyChallenge.com train. Woo! Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the School of Last podcast. Rick Roberts here. Thanks again to our sponsors, the Clean Comedy Challenge. You definitely want to take advantage of that if you live anywhere near or have the time to travel to Chicago or Pasadena. And thanks to Ron Havens, one of our Patreon supporters. And if you are a Patreon supporter at the Club 52 level, you'll receive an invitation to this Saturday's Hangout. We're going to use the Zoom platform. You'll get an invitation by email about 15 minutes prior to the call, and you can click any of the links to join in by your tab tablet, your laptop, computer, or your phone. Looking forward to talking to you then. Hey, this week I've got a great interview with Susan Sussman. She's out in Norfolk, Virginia. She's also a Club 52 member, and I met up with her when I did a show out there, did a corporate event, and invited her to come by and check out the show, and we talked about setting up her first fundraiser event at the temple she attends, and what this is is a two-part in one podcast. You hear the conversation we have prior to the uh, event that she was planning with some suggestions on how to run the whole thing and then I follow up halfway through the episode to find out how it actually went. So without further ado, let's jump right in now to the podcast for this week, an interview with Susan Sussman about setting up your first fundraiser. A couple of questions if you want. Um, couple questions. Oh yeah, I'm I'm putting together a. I got the thumbs up at my <clears throat> temple. I'm going to be putting together a comedy show. The first one there in February. <clears throat> and is that the first Saturday. one they've ever had too? Yep. So the mm-hmm. first comedy show for you, first time they've ever hosted one at the temple. So that's a lot of yeah, a lot of firsts. First. <clears throat> it's got to be good. It's got to be good. So you've got you and how many other people on the show? Um, right. I'm thinking five or six. You know, maybe um, I have me. I have the headliner. I'm thinking maybe him for 30 minutes. Uh, I have another guy, 15, 20 minutes. Um, myself, I'm not sure if I should host and then do maybe a 10, 10 minute set or get someone else to host. And then, you know, although if I do host, it might give some of them an idea in the audience, you know, that I could be a good host for other events. That's a good point. You know, a good MC or host is a, a skill that there's not as many people out there that do that as you think. Mm-hmm. It's in higher demand. Mm-hmm. And it also gives you the chance to, as a host to correct the show if it starts to go off the wheels at some point. Right. You know, if you're if you put yourself up third in the show or something like that and the first two comics aren't really bringing it. Right. Then you're going to have to dig that hole fill in that hole and get yourself back on the steady ground yeah. before it moves forward but as a host uh, you don't even bring somebody else out on stage so you've got the crowd warmed up in the right place and by doing the, the kind of comedy you do at least the other comics should kind of see what's working with the audience uh-huh. and then if, if one of them goes up there and they start to bomb a little bit or a lot you know you can kind of give them the light come back up and reestablish the solid ground for the next comic so right. it's uh, it's a good question like I would probably host it and that way also you could 
bring back that comedy show every quarter, every half year, annually or whatever, uh-huh. and be the host of that show with new comics the next time. Right. To whereas, you know, if you're in the second or third comic in the lineup, they, um, it's not that you couldn't host the next time around, but it kind of be nice that you are the through line, yeah. especially for the temple, because they, they'll trust you as the host more than they will somebody else to host that, since you're in communication with them already. Right. Yeah. And so four or five comics, um, no problem with that. I'm always wary of having too many comics on a show, because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of comics, it takes a few minutes to kind of get rolling. And so if you have too many, a majority of the time of the show, the comics are just trying to get their pace established. Right. I see that. Yeah. So if, yeah. if they're established and they're good, then there's no problem with it. But if they're a little bit newer, it does take them a little little longer ramp up time on stage. Right. And then the other side of that, too, is if they really love this show and you had five comics this year and you want to do it next year, they're going to expect five comics again next year. Mm-hmm. And if you do less, then they'll probably expect to pay you less because, hey, you only had three comics this year instead of five. Right. And then the other part of that is how many comics do you have that to choose from that could do this show again? If you only have six or seven in the area, then you might be better off doing three or four comics this time than you'd be the repeat person next time and have the other ones come on yeah. board. Now, we have a ton of comics in this area now. It is unbelievable how many there are, but they're not all ready. For, right. You know. And then I was going to ask, like, what about the energy uh, for the show? Um, I don't want, I have, I know one woman who's maybe high energy. I wanted to have at least two females on there, myself and one other person. And then I have someone else in mind who's more of a, a quieter, lower energy, but she's still very funny. Right. Um, and then the guys, um, I know the guys are up and down. Uh-huh. I would, as far as energy, that's one component to look at, but I'd also look at how, like if you guys are just going to put a poster out, mm-hmm. visually, you want the show to look, every comic to look different. Like, you know, even if I was going to do a show with four other middle-aged white guys, right. I'd probably want a guy that was a little heavier, guys a little taller, a guy that spoke a little bit different, maybe a different accent. So there's enough variety during the course of the show that people won't either mm-hmm. compare two of the comics in the show together. Okay. That's one thing you always want to avoid is having two comics that are very similar or even fairly similar on the same show if you can avoid it. And so... You know, style and stuff like that is one thing that plays into it. The energy is a separate one. But all things being equal, if you think you've got four or five completely diverse comics up there, it's not a bad idea to look at yourself as the host and see what kind of energy you bring. Look at the headliner and what kind of energy they bring. Like, is your headliner higher energy, low energy, middle? It's kind of middle. So if you had a higher energy female on the show Uh or even a male, you probably wouldn't want to put them right before the headliner right that's what I mean. you want yeah. somebody that's maybe a little less energy equally as funny mm-hmm. but a little less so that, that headliner can shine okay and if that headliner is a male it makes sense to have a female in front of him to kind of visually make it different yeah um uh, i'm trying to think other things i can tell you but ba- basically you want to show as much diversity in the show as you can okay. and that mm-hmm. just keeps it interesting for the audience every time somebody steps on stage or a foot taller a foot shorter man mm-hmm. girl mm-hmm. uh white person of color whatever you might say and then people walk out going, man, that was a com- – everybody was great, and they were all completely different. Right. And that way you can really showcase everybody's talents and uh-huh. what they have naturally stands out better. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah. not knowing the, the four or five people involved, you, you know them better than I do. So, you know, take that into consideration. And then as you're putting the lineup together, you know, if you're unsure on, like, the second and third person or third and fourth person, but you've got everything else figured out, maybe uh-huh. just ask them. I mean, would you be more comfortable going before this person or after? And just let them know the the idea is for the entire show to build and finish super strong. Right. So right. that's you know that's three. There's probably three different ways to put this show together. Right. And you might hit it out of the park the first time. You might may have missed one thing, and mm-hmm. and even a great comic can have an off night. They can kind of throw it off as well. But right. And how long? Uh, and ninety minutes. Or? You know what I would do is put it in a range. So. When I book myself for corporate events like the one I'm going to do today, right. I put it in a 50 to 60 minute range. Okay. You know, I know I can do an hour, but I also know sometimes audiences, like this group today will have had four different keynote speakers. Oh, wow. And they've been sitting in the same chairs uh-huh. all day long. So 50 might be all they need. Mm-hmm. Really, 45 is probably all they really need. Uh-huh. But, you know, event planners, they usually look in a one hour block. Right. Temple, since it's new, you know, they're looking at you for the template. So I would book a 70 to 90 minute show. Okay. You know, maybe 80, 80 to 90, just so there's a little range in there. Because, you know, the audience may 
maybe a little tight. You might actually do a two hour show in one hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like sometimes you go through your whole set and like that should have been an hour, 40 minutes into the show. <laughs> really? So give yourself a little range and, um, you know, unless they ask for it, I wouldn't even mention how long the show's going to go. Just say it'll yeah. be a fun evening. Yeah. You know. Should uh, I should I um, do any like improv at the end with people or have anyone or that that takes away it being a really good comedy show? Well, it it puts like a variable in there. Huh? It puts a variable in place that could uh, go either way. Uh, okay. If you know your headliner is strong and they finish strong and you feel like the crowd's had plenty of humor, right? If you leave them wanting more, yeah. then they'll come back to the next one. Okay. You know, if you do a ninety minute show, and then you get some improv going. It takes five or ten minutes to kind of get the people involved and. All of a sudden, it's not as good as it was. Yeah, yeah I think I'll just leave it at, at stand up. Yeah, you know? I would leave it stand up this time and maybe yeah. you know down the road incorporate a little <laughs> bit of that. But leading off first time at a venue, first time doing the show like this, I would kind of hedge my bets and and go with mm -hmm. not necessarily what's safe, but what's more reliable. Yeah, and paying the comics that just depends on. Yeah, and you can work a million right. different things out. So this is going to be ticketed at, at what, $15 a head or something 15, like that? 15 uh, in advance and 20 at the door. And, and it seats. food is separate. Okay, and it seats 20. 200 or so, you it's, said? Yeah, about 200, 250. So if it's sold out, you're looking at 3500 to 4000 plus for yeah, the night for the, on the tickets. As the fundraiser. So. Yeah. Um, I won't take any money because it's my temple, so. Well, that's nice of you. What I, what I, what, well, no, they actually said that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you could always say is go ahead and pay me, but I'll put it right back in the offering plate. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be a tax write-off, and, right. and which is totally fine for you right to do as well. Right on the Passover plate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with, uh, yeah. With fundraisers, they're almost always game with splitting the door. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that sounds totally fine to them. So if you sold $4,000 worth of tickets and you had 2000 to pay the comics out, and you had four or five comics. Boy, comics would be lining up for me to do another show, I'll tell you. Well, I think I think they deserve it. Uh -huh. So and, do I. And some of them are poo-pooing. Well, you know. again, I would say, you know what? Do me a favor and accept the check this time. Right. And if you want to make a donation or something afterwards or tithe it, that's a great mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. But if you don't take this this time or you argue about it or it's – we're not going to be able to get this budget the next time around. Mm, good point. So you want to set the standard that, hey, this is what the expectation is, and these are the kind of quality comics I can get for you with this right. kind of budget. You know, and if some comics want to donate that right back, that's fine. Right. Good but idea. It, but at least you have that in place. So mm -hmm. it, it'll help you more next show than it will this show to make sure those comics get paid. Right. And then I'll, I'm sure all the comics that do this one, if they have a good time and they were able to make some money, they'll be more than happy to come around the next time around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I, mm -hmm. you know. We have a, a high stage in that room. It's a huge room, you know. A lot of people know what that, like a conference room. And um, I'm just thinking, they have a platform. I could get a lower stage. Would that maybe be a better idea? Because that, that stage is at least five feet. High yeah, I would. Ground, maybe would they be able to put the same state, the stage in the same place and and lower it? Yeah, I would mm -hmm. do that by. Yeah, yeah. One of my biggest things that I've noticed over all these years is if the stage is more than a f really eighteen inches, two feet off the ground, you know, as long as they can see, that's all they need to see. But if it gets too much higher than that, for me, there's a separation, you know, and I'm looking down at people, right? And it's you know, you're getting shadows, and you're they mm -hmm. can't see your facial expressions as well, right? As I get as close to their level as I can. Mm -hmm. I prefer to be on the same level when I do events, if at all possible. Now, if there's 300 in the room, you might need to be up a mm -hmm. foot or two. But besides that, it, it kind of becomes a... For me, I don't like it. Some yeah. comics prefer that, and they prefer the audience to be in complete darkness, and they don't even want to see the people they're talking to. I'm the complete opposite. I want to be as in the middle of the group. I want to be part of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, again, it might be something you ask your... I wouldn't even ask your other comics about it. I would just make that decision to get a lower one right now. Right. And then the lighting, um, you don't want to, like, have it bright. In the room? Yeah, in the room. Probably not for, for what you're doing. I would, uh, again, what I would do is have the, make sure the stage area is fully lit. And when you lower the stage, make sure that the lights are lowered, too. Because the lights might be set to hit people at four feet tall, four feet up off the ground, but not at one. Um, chances are it's a flood, you know, a wash as they call it, and it'd be fine. But I would check that out. Maybe right. next time you go by, Get just in advance. yeah, maybe just stand on the ground. And if, if the Just light's hitting your head, then you're going to be fine because it's going to be hitting higher too. And then um, as far as the audience, if they have the light on a dimmer, that's the best possible thing. 
Uh, you can start the, start the evening a little brighter, and as it gets closer to showtime, dim it. And then it's up to you how far down you go. I would still like to be able to see at least the first three or four rows eyes because right. I can be conversational on stage, and I yeah. want to be able to see who I'm talking to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I never like it so dark where I could walk off the stage right and land in the front row or, <laughs> or have people get up and leave and me not know. <laughs> like, right. That's the other thing, too. I think when it's a little bit, a little bit brighter in the audience, for me, uh, there's zero heckling because they, they're not invisible. And they don't get up and leave because I would notice. Um, and so people tend to stay oh, in their like seats that. when it's lit more. Yeah, I like that. Plus, we, we're going to have, probably have like bar food, but on the side. Uh-huh. So people can go over and buy stuff. And that way they can get up during the show if they want and get food. And yeah. I recommend on I, that one. They do it before they come. I would, they're going to open the doors like an hour before. Yeah. The show. I would advise having them stop the food once the show starts. Oh, okay. If it's an option. Okay. And that way nobody's getting up. Same thing if there's a, a bar in the room or a bartender, you know, making announcements 10 minutes before the show starts. Hey, we're going to start right now. The bar will be closed during the show. So if you think you might need an extra one, now's a great time to go grab it. They even do that 15 minutes before the show starts. Mm-hmm. That way people know they can go grab a cigarette if they need to or what have you. Mm-hmm. Hit the restroom, grab a drink. And then they've got the full focus on you guys during the show. Oh, okay. Oh. Those are my tips. Let me know how it turns out. Yeah, it's not till the end of fe- toward the end of February. Okay. So, and and I even having them pick a snow date because Very. it doesn't snow much here, but it could it could it could. So yep. uh, and here like everything closes when there's a quarter of an inch of snow. Right. They don't have any plows or anything. So um, yeah, this area is crazy with snow. Yeah, I think it's smart to have this, the backup date already, and I would even put the the backup date on the ticket and all the posters, so you don't have to yeah. reprint anything after the fact. That's what I was thinking. I said, you know, we're selling tickets in advance. If it snows and there's no, we have to cancel the show. What about all the people that bought tickets? Yeah. So we we have to have a backup show. That's awesome. So. Well, cool, Susan. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thanks for making time to pop in here today. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me to. I can't wait to see you perform today. Hey, thank you. Should be fun. So I'm here with Susan. Uh, as you heard on the first half of the podcast, she was getting ready to put on her first fundraiser, and it was also going to be the first comedy show they ever had at her temple. And since the recording, they went ahead and did the show. So first off, Susan, uh, overall, how did you think the show went? Oh, it was fabulous. The turnout was way more than uh, anyone expected. You know, yeah. we had 150, 150 people in all at the wow. event. And I yeah. remember a couple of maybe a week or two before the event, you shot me an email. There was only a few people that had bought tickets. And I'm like, well, you know, it's okay to cancel a show. And that's probably what I would do. But you you stuck through with it and found that lots of people signed up at the last minute, huh? Yeah, they were telling me, uh, yeah, I was real nervous about it because we had been advertising it already for about six weeks. It was a really good graphic artist. We did press release, all kinds of stuff. And we had like three people sign up, like, three weeks before the show and a lot of people were telling me at the temple that a lot of people just wait for the last minute to sign up for these events two weeks before the show we had 54 signed up uh one week before the show uh, um no 32 and then one week before 54 the morning before the show or the day before we had 84 and then by the time i got there at six the night before the show we had um uh, table set up for 150 people. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. You know, I probably would have freaked out a little bit, but, you know, it's good to kind of listen to those other people and say that's the kind of the culture here, it's late signups, late arrivals or whatever. And But, man, that's a little nerve-wracking, huh? Oh, it was, yeah, especially when it's my first one. You know, it was the first one I was doing. I was trying to prove myself a little bit to the temple community. And I, I remember we yeah. had talked about the – the setup of the stage and everything and that there was a kind of a raised stage that was pretty high up and you were thinking about putting a, a stage lower. What did you, did you end up deciding to do with that? Um, I ended up just using the regular stage. It wasn't as high up as I thought, you know, I went back, checked out the room a couple times. And I also brought in one of the, like I said, my friend, uh, Sid, who's a comedian, he was going to be in the show. He also ha- has, produced a few at his temple and he looked at it he said nah it's good this way and it really wasn't that high up so so we didn't have to bring in uh, a platform so that worked out well 
That's good. And where did you set the ticket price at? Uh, the tickets were fifteen dollars a piece and twenty at the door, and that's, that's um, cool. that was good. Yeah, that worked well too. That's pretty cool. And then, um, how many comics did you end up having on the show? I had, including myself, six. Okay. So I had, I hosted, I hosted and did about a twelve-minute set. Um, I, I had one guy do seven minutes. He was also a Temple member. Uh, that's been doing stand up in the area. And then I had three of them do 15 a piece and the headliner did about a half hour. Yeah. So just, just a little bit over 90 minutes. That sounds like a, a pretty good show. It was, it was really, it went really well, flowed well. Everybody complimented me on the show. Um, and um, should I talk a little bit about who to hire, you know, who to bring in? Yeah. Tell me how you set that up. Um, you know, I made a list of comics that I knew, and you know, I just want to say when someone said to me, who runs a, a couple rooms, said nobody should ever do a show before they've been in, in the community doing comedy for about three years, and that was the best advice I ever got because a lot of people jump into this stuff right away, they have no experience, <clears throat> and I knew the comedians. Um, I knew what kind of show I wanted, so I, I invited people that uh, I knew could do a solid, and it was a clean show. So mm -hmm. They had to be people I could depend on, and I knew their stuff, and um, and I knew we'd show up, you know. So that's a great point. Yeah. You know, you can you can ask around who's a good comic and get get some names, but unless you've seen them and worked with them in other temperament and know that they will sacrifice maybe a few jokes for the betterment of the entire show. It's just the comfort level of producing that show goes way up and especially bringing it to your temple where you, you know, you've got to show up at your temple next week, whether, <laughs> whether the show goes good or not, or find a new temple. <laughs> exactly. And I knew, you know, I, I kind of knew what the crowd, it was open to the public. It was not a private show. So, but in general, I knew, where the people were at meant, meant for my temple. So I knew what they would like and not like. Not not exactly, but I, I knew what, what they would not approve of. A lot of things went well. Tell me about, you don't have to get specific or names or anything, but were there things that popped up the day of the show or right before the show that kind of you're like from the, from the venue where you're like, really, let me do my show and just stay out of it, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, the day before the show, the uh, director tells me she is going to have people order pizza in from the tables while the show <laughs> is going on. Really? So, they're, so they're, they're ordering pizza from where? That's my question. Like, where were they? Was it coming in from Domino's or was it from back in the kitchen? Yeah, like Domino's and Pizza Hut. <laughs> and uh, I said, you can't. I said to her, you can't do that. She said, why not? I said, because. Um, you know, it interrupts the show. She's never run a show before. So tell me how that worked out. Like, were, were Domino's pizza delivery guys walking up to different tables making transactions during the show? No, no. They came up, they came into the temple, into the hallway before we were in a big hall. So they didn't come in there. I think you, yeah. just, you should have got some money from the pizza places. This sounds like it might be an inside job of a. Uh, some kickbacks or something going on at the temple. Well, well, I I texted all the comics the, the message them the day before or a couple of days before. I said, look, this is what's going to happen. Be prepared. So everybody came up with a bunch of jokes for this. That's great. Yeah. I know it's like a, a million things will come at you the last minute. You're like, what in the world? Um, tell me about what you did advertising wise. Was it strictly posters or did you do some Facebook or online or anything like that? Lots of stuff. Um, the temple has an in-house graphic uh, artist website person. That was awesome. So together we um, we planned a poster, and um, you know she said she's tired of the brick wall thing. So she came up with something cool, and I had to get um, I got photos and short bios from all my comics, and. Um, she put a nice poster together, plus she put the poster on the uh, for the temple website. 
Uh, she printed them up, which went in the hallway at the temple, and I took some and I gave a few out, and people posted them around town. Um, and then uh, I just kept doing it on Facebook. Uh, I took the link. I put it on my Facebook page. We had two links. We had one where they can just snap right onto it, and they could. it took them right to the page where they could buy tickets. Gotcha. And then, yeah, and then they had uh, a page where, you know, you could read the bios and stuff. We pretty much covered all the generations. Mm-hmm. You know, we had emails, we had phone number to call for reservations, and we had online reservations. So anybody could get involved in it, you know, could could get tickets. Because there's a, an older population there, so that doesn't use um, Facebook or uh, online ordering. So that way they could just call up. Right. And, uh, and there was a press release. There were a couple press releases in the Jewish News. I just made it a habit every single week. Uh, to advertise it, and then I sent all the comics a link that they could uh, do it too. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing all that with us, and uh, I can't wait for the listeners to hear this, learn a few things, and maybe uh, if you're listening to the podcast and you've got some ideas of how you can make shows even better, or if you listen to this specific episode and thought, man, there's one thing they could have done, uh, shoot it to us, schooloflast at gmail.com, and I'll compile a short list and put it in the blog post down the road. But thanks again, Susan. I appreciate it. Yeah, and then you have my uh, website now, too. You can put on there. So That's true. SusanSussmanComedy.com. That way you can go and look and see who you've been listening to for the past half hour. And thanks, Susan, for being part of the Club yeah. 52 as well, for supporting the podcast. And uh, that's one reason I was happy to you know, get you on and meet up with you in Norfolk when I was there a while back. And, and I'm just excited to see the stuff that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I think your club has helped me, push me a little bit to keep going and, and all your tips. And it, it's really a great thing that you've done. Um, I appreciate you know, it. So people should be involved with it. Definitely be involved. Yeah, it's been a, a yeah. blessing for me. I've gotten a lot of good insight and tips from everybody else that's in Club 52. So it's been a win-win for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Rick. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Well, there you have it. Susan Sussman was setting up her first fundraiser. What a success that was. 150 people turned out at $15 a ticket. Nice job. And I was about to tell her to pull the plug about two weeks out. Hey, it just goes to show, even though you've been in it this long, you don't always know everything. So great to hear that success story from Susan. A Club 52 member, don't forget, if you are in Club 52, we have the Zoom Hangout this Saturday, April 22nd. That's Earth Day. Ooh. From 1 to 2 Central Time, uh, you can jump on that phone call with an invitation only sent by email, and I'll send that to all the Club 52 members at the $7 a month or more level. And thanks to you guys for supporting the podcast and making this thing happen. Hey, a couple quick announcements really quick. If you are in the Nashville area and you want to take the Business of Comedy class, that takes place on Saturday, May 13th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the School of Last headquarters just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Also, if you'd like to take the writing class, that's coming up live in Nashville as well, May 8th, 15th, and 22nd. If you're interested in any of those things, just shoot me an email at schooloflaughs at gmail.com. And until next time, thanks again. And here's one more word from our sponsor this week, the Clean Comedy Challenge. The Clean Comedy Challenge invites comedians of all levels to have a chance to work on a real comedy stage with real comedy pros watching and privately critiquing you. It's Eddie Brill, Dwayne Kennedy, Doby Mack. Maxwell, Jimmy Brogan, Dennis Regan, they'll all be on board for these private critiques and seminars. So you don't want to miss out. It's no auditioning, early fee before May 1st. Go to www.cleancomedychallenge.com. When you register, make sure you mention the School of Laughs podcast so I know where you came from. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Last podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit SchoolofLaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay funny.